So, hello everybody. Um, here we are with the most basic, most uh, disarming of briefs to dissect in the time we have available. What opera companies need from artist managers. It couldn't get more basic than that. Uh, I'm Andrew Green. Uh, I was, in the distant past, an artist manager. Brackets failed. <laughs> and as a a pleasant penance, I guess. I've been writing about artist managers for at least a quarter of a century since then. But there we go, mainly in classical music magazine. Uh, on your behalf, let me welcome uh, our guests. Their names are down there in your, in your agenda, but I'll say a little bit more about each of them. We have Laura Canning on the far right there, Director of Artistic Administration at Garsington Opera, up at uh, Wonderful Wormsley, which is my friendly neighbourhood opera company. Uh, Laura's had the previous experience of working at Glyndebourne, Welsh National Opera, and at uh, Houston Grand Opera. She also has artist manager experience, let well, it be artist said. artist manager assistant experience. Let's well, <laughs> let's talk it up. At the Athol still. <laughs> no, that's and, much more important. <laughs> fair enough. But at Harold Holt, when it was still Harold Holt. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. welcome to you, Laura. Thank That's great. You. And thank God it's a, it's a Monday evening. On Tuesdays, uh, Laura always does the pub quiz. <laughs> I should so never we're, put we're that very on lucky. <laughs> uh, James Clutton to Laura's left, uh, Director of Opera at uh, Opera Holland Park, operating alongside the legendary OHP founder Michael Volpe, whose uh, autobiography was one of the most entertaining reads in the last uh, five years or so. So he says. <laughs> so he says, indeed. <laughs> And, uh, and James earned his spurs as an independent producer of uh, theatre around the UK, including working with the amazing Bill Kenwright, who I only know as something to do with so Everton Football Club. <laughs> yeah. And then, to, in my immediate right, Bruno Michel, uh, head of artistic administration at uh, Classical Opera for many years uh, in the artistic field at the Châtelet in Paris, and then at Leipzig Opera, uh, also with an artist manager background, yes, working for Robert Gilder, who's here today, and at Lise Askenaz, when it was still Lise Askenaz. Well, look, let's be as practical as, as we can in the time that we've actually got. And, and first of all, let me ask Laura, and indeed everybody else, you know, how many communications do you get from an artist manager per week, and what sort of communications are there? Because there's so many ways in which you can be contacted now. Yeah. First of all, the number that you get. I let's leaving aside any contractual negotiations or actually responses to an email that I've sent. I would say I get somewhere in the region of a hundred, hundred and twenty emails a week from uh, general, uh, st either specific or more often general emails about what artists. So, what, what is a general email, and what's what's in it? Are they long, short? Oh, they're, they're usually very long. I, I, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's timely because, of course, today is the first work day of the month. So today is the day where everybody's newsletters has arrived. Um, and uh, so I've, I've had the delight of deleting probably 15 emails today, <laughs> um, as everybody tells me everything that all of their artists are doing in December. But, but does, no, does nothing ever, ever catch your eye? You, you stop and... Do you and know, I always do, I always flick down the list of names in case there are singers I've forgotten. Um, and then I file it. Uh, the, 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 the title never grabs you. There's no, never something in the title that says, I'm, I, this one I will actually look at. Oh, okay. I was just talking about the newsletters. Um, it's always very obvious when it's an email which has actually been written just to me or when it's an email that's gone to 600 people on a mailing list. And how many of those do you get? Oh, the well, very personal of, of The very personal ones? That's probably more like three or four a day. So that's quite rare. Yeah. Um, and those ones I will try and answer eventually. <laughs> yeah. um, the, yeah. Everything else just goes in the bin. Well, let's hear from James. And, uh, is, is that similar to your experience? Yeah, it's about the same sort of numbers, I think. I mean, it goes up and down in different weeks, but uh, I think that's about the same numbers. I, uh, like Laura, I use those newsletters more as a reference quickly to see if I've forgotten people. I think that's a good way to, mm -hmm. to use those. Um, but on the whole, uh, once again, it's the personal ones that you read more detail. But I think it's, uh, it's good as a reference point to get in. But obviously, uh, there's some singers that we wouldn't be looking at because uh, they're much more money than we've got. So you sort of tend to immediately get rid of those. And so that becomes just a habit as you deal with things but, slightly differently. But what is a, pers a personalised email? What, what is that? What, 
describe it for me? Uh, well, it's more about, I think, uh, over a period of time, there's a few agents in here that are, uh, are like this with me. Um, but if they've got to know my taste, then they would know that. They say, I, I've just taken on a singer that is absolutely your taste. Uh, and I know that you're doing this piece in two years. This is someone I want you to think about. Uh, just So they've gauged your taste in some sort yeah, of way. Yeah, I think way. ultimately, I think that this is the thing that um, the people in here that I work with closely would know that they know what my taste is. And it, it would be similar to these guys, but different in different things. And then it's just about gauging that and saying, no, I... Uh, I know that he will like them, or I've got a good idea they will like them, so let's try and push it to him now. Yeah. Uh, before I move on to Bruno, can I ask both of you, in, insofar as you have so many communications via email, how often, Laura first, do you actually have a face-to-face -face with somebody? That's, that's an interesting question. I would say that whenever I'm asked for a meeting from somebody who... who who I know or who has artists on their list that I know, I would always say yes to that meeting. And I would say that probably I have about 15 meetings a year. It seems a tiny number to me. James, is that, does that make sense to you? <laughs> uh, I think that out, most of mine like that, I have to say, would be during the season itself, when I could say, well, come into the, come into the theatre and see me before the show. Much less than that for me, probably. Uh, just because I think that most of it <clears throat> tends to be, we're all a bit um, frantic with work, the agents as well as us, and I think that it just things that you've done that and you've made an effort to have a meeting and a lot of it obviously can be done on, on mail or on the phone. Um, but I think that uh, yeah, in the season I've, I tend to have a lot more of those, pretty not that formal, but just come in early, see me, yeah. and we'll have a chat before you, before you see the show at our theatre. But Bruno, if we move on to you from your experience in Paris and, and Leipzig, would you, would you be doing more face-to-face -face than these two, in fact, more face-to-face -face meetings? Probably, yes. Um, is this working? It is. Uh, probably, <laughs> yes. Uh, it really all depends on the relationship you have with a manager. As far as face-to-face -face is concerned, to me, it's useful to make an acquaintance with a with person. You hold it a wee bit close to the... To make an acquaintance with a person, and I think a face-to-face -face is usually needed when a person has founded a new agency or when a person has um, taken over a division and you don't know them personally. Once you know the person on a personal level, sorry for the alliteration, um, it, it's much easier to then conduct business over the phone or in any other way that modern technology allows. Yeah, but how is that personal relationship actually developed? How does it develop? Because Only over a period of time, but, but how? Of time. Um, I think a lot of managers will make the effort when, uh, when I was at the Chatelier, a lot of managers would make the effort, even if they didn't have a specific thing they wanted to discuss, um, to ask for a meeting with me as part of their Paris trip. They would have a meeting with the Paris Opera, they'd have a meeting with the Champs-Élysées, they'd have a meeting with the Opéra Comique and with an orchestra, and they'd have a meeting with me. If the person actually went out of their way to request a meeting, even if I didn't have any particular casting needs, then I would indeed meet them because it does um, keep the relationship going. And because very often in a meeting like that, you'll end up finding out about an artist you didn't know yet, mm -hmm. or finding out about a new development, an artist who's having a change of repertoire, and you can't have an eye on everything. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you will keep the relationship going by meeting those managers who make the effort to come and see you. However, I do think that modern technologies have made it so that overall there is a trend in having less and less meetings. Yeah, when you talk about people making the effort, g given your background in Paris and Leipzig, were you at all influenced when somebody actually was able to converse you within, were, converse with, in, with you in French and German? You're the master of any number of languages, Bruno. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary the number no, of languages you speak. Not really. No, it's, so it would, it would not, if you keep sorry. that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I don't think that, you know, because I do speak a few languages and. Yeah. No, but in general, other, other people in your position, in, in other opera houses, do you think it matters that you should be able to speak at least French, German, and Italian? No. It no, the artists yeah. should, obviously, but uh, not, um, not the managers. I do think that English is very much the international language. Even if Germany is the largest single market in your opera or the German-speaking world in Europe, you can go on doing a lot of business in the German-speaking world without speaking German. I don't know if it's rude or not, but you can. So I think, you know, 
<laughs> you know, I mean, one should like to think that one, one would have to learn German, but overall, with English, you can get by everywhere. Yeah. Uh, James, the completely unknown artist manager to you gets in touch out of the blue and maybe does it in that very personalized way that you're talking about. Will you grant them a hearing if they're completely unknown? I think it's all about the approach. You know, I, a Which lot means of, what? Uh, just writing to me uh, personally and with some knowledge of us as well. Mm. I think that um, I say this, it's not the same for artist managers, but I say this to singers a lot when I do talks at colleges or whatever. But um, uh, at our level, in, you know, there's like 10, 12 companies in this country. If you haven't found out who that person is you need to write to, then that feels like you haven't really made an effort and uh, or the sort of stuff that you're doing. And so um, having some sort of gauge that they've understood who I am and who we, what we are, then that's OK, they've made that effort, let's, let's see. Does that accord with you, Laura? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If somebody sent an email to our artistic director wanting a discussion about casting, which has then been forwarded on to me, I'm going to have a very different response to somebody who contacts me and asks for that meeting. And, and is it clear, I, I guess it must be, if somebody has actually been up to Garsing's Opera or Opera Holland Park or, or wherever and actually inhabited the territory, seen what it's like? Is it obvious to you? And does it matter? It's not necessarily obvious instantly. It becomes obvious very quickly. And I don't mind if they haven't. What I mind is people pretending that they have. And I, it's, I, I, if there's one takeaway that I want to put in this room today, it's just, it, it's so much better to admit a lack of knowledge than to try and pretend that you know something you don't. We are so reliant on you as our intermediaries with the artist, and vice versa. The artist is just as reliant on you. And if you are anything less than 120% sure about something, you have to check. And I, I see that going wrong on so many levels in so many ways. Um, and that's when companies start going around you and starting to tr start trying to talk to singers direct. And that's terrible for everybody. Um, so. Yeah, if not everybody can come to Garthington. Our tickets are very expensive. We're not very handy. We don't have that many performances. We're pretty handy, Laura. We're pretty handy for you. Yeah. <laughs> London. But if, an, if a new agent comes to me and says, I've been reading about some of the things you've done. I've watched some of your work on Opera Vision. I'm really interested in some of your casting. Um, can we have a meeting? Um, and I'd love to come to one of your dress rehearsals this year just to see it in... in, in um, uh, face to face in c concrete reality that I think is very interesting and that I will always come up with a ticket and I will probably have a drink with that person at that, at I that think, point. I think that is it I think that um, if anyone no no one in this room is under this misapprehension I'm sure but if anyone thinks anyone in our jobs isn't an egomaniac or make a maniac they're wrong so you've <laughs> got to appeal to that but I do think though that if um, with when singers do it more than agents obviously but um if a singer says, my big thing is Handel, I, uh, this is a recordings of my Handel work, and, and we haven't done Handel ever, <laughs> yeah, that always makes me think, well, that's, that's a lack of, uh, and that, that happens a lot. Yeah. Bruno, lot. the brave new world of masses of video clips, you know, at, at, at your fingertips. Um, do artist managers, I'm making this up as I go along, but do artist managers actually uh, give a huge amount of thought to exactly what they are transmitting in the video? Is it well targeted? Some. Does it say what you want it to say? Or s some. Some artist managers you can see have made real, uh, have gone into real effort to target a video for a certain market. They will probably send one video to a certain festival, and another one to a main opera house, and another one to an orchestra. Um, some have absolutely not done any um, background work, and some of them, unfortunately, I have to say, have not even watched the video themselves. Because, really? Yes, because there's oh, been so often, oh. so often. Well, I do, cannot. Do, in the last two weeks, no, in the last two weeks, I've had one vid uh, video sent to me which stopped after the recit. No aria, and I've had another aria sent to me while I'm recording where they played the intro. She sang the first phrase, and she said, "Oh, sorry, stop. Can we start again? I'll cut that out." <laughs> in the last two weeks. Yeah, but, but, you know, do go on. Yes. Because uh, otherwise, they, if I'm not going to be going into artistic judgment uh, issues, but some, very often you will get videos and you tell yourself, if you'd watch the video until the very end, and if you'd listen to the money notes, we all know it, 
um, you wouldn't have seen this video at all because this person is actually not at their best at all in that video and you should know better than sending it because it's actually not doing your artist any favor. And I've had people sending me videos say, oh, you, you, you'll be aware of how wonderful her top range is and you hear the top range and you think, oh. <laughs> and you know that the manager has actually gotten the video from the artist, has listened to 30 seconds of the video and is using it relentlessly without actually having listened to it at all. Yeah. Or but worse, the agent thinks that's good. And that, that's, I know. And, but then, and that's, then, you know, we're trying to be charitable up here. We're trying to presume that the, uh, the agent hasn't had no. time to listen to it. Yeah. There will be other people who are then going to go, well, I'm not going to listen to anything that agent sends again. Because suddenly you're on a different level of, of right. communication. But, but look, I, I, maybe it's better to let somebody from the floor say this, but, but all you're, you're describing something that you, you want artist marriage to be really targeted in the way they approach you, really targeted with the videos, and they will say, that takes so much time yes. to get it right. And none of us have much of that, but we have to. It's the job. It yeah. is the job. Yes. It is the job. And you want so much of our time to, I mean, you know, you, it, listen, we've got to listen to the whole video, ideally, right? You don't want us just listening to 20 seconds. Also, timings on the video, if it's not edited, tell the artistic director, I'm going to have to Yeah. Some of the videos that I get sent, I, I mean, literally, the, the iPod, the, the iPhone from the back of the hall, the, with the coughing next to them, I mean, all the time those are coming through. Oh, well, could that apply even to some very well-known management? Yes. Really? Yes. You would, you would agree? Yes, I would, I would agree so, because you will have, basically, you have conscientious people in every part of the industry and you will have some people in very small agencies who are very conscientious and others who are not and in big agencies with 10 divisions you will have some managers uh, whom you know are, are very conscientious and they will never send a video like that because they'll watch it three times over not once three times over and they'll go back to their artists and say i'm sorry but please find something else to tackle but the bottom line is that a video could work magic it is perfectly possible for I it to do so we, we are saying that i don't know what you're talking about as far as working mages a video could get my attention a video yeah. could not get a person engaged yeah that's the first step so the process then the process starts with a video yeah. but a video will, I'm, i've i've not engaged anybody on a video ever because god knows right. i mean the agents are sometimes not conscientious they will send you a video and you look at the artist and you vaguely know the artist and you ask them so when was that video taken then? Yes. Yeah. And you said you hear 2006, and you okay, um, yeah. you know. So a video is the first step. Yeah, James, you got anything to add to that? In fact, on the no, video, I, video, I give my yeah. colleagues okay. to sum that up. We'll but look, look, can this I, is all. This can is I just say one other thing about videos? Because I think. Do, to be charitable, we put so much pressure on you to provide recorded material that sometimes there's, I think, a sense that if you don't send anything, that's worse than sending something bad. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I, th I, I think there is a big issue where singers do not believe that recordings and video recordings are as valuable as they are. And I think that's where you can really take this forward and make our lives easier, is by actually really bringing home to them and really making it feasible for them to put forward good recordings, good live unedited recordings that we can actually use. Let's have maybe some general questions right at the very end, but has anybody, insofar as all this has been fairly critical of the profession, does anybody want to be critical of, of how these guys do their job? Not, not these, I mean, in general, in general terms, <laughs> nothing personal, but is there anything you would like to say about the way that you know, your, your approaches are handled? that they can sort of answer. This is your moment. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah, yes. I think that when we hear that a company is looking for a, for a, a certain voice type for a particular role, and we have, we've done the research, we know the house, we know the taste of the house, we know the artist has sung the role before, somewhere comparable or even some, sometimes in a high-level house. If we pitch the artist, and we don't get a reply. Not ever. I I don't understand that. Has my email no, been seen? Has it been read? I mean, just nothing. Just nothing. Yeah. So the answer, James, you, you want to answer um, that? Well, it's easy Would for you me please to say guilty? this because no, no, because I never respond to emails anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but, uh, but, my, but I've got a team that does, and they're very, they're very You hide behind your team, James. Yeah, but I think that, no, I'm saying that I'm honest. I don't, I don't reply to them, but I, I might tell them what to say, or, or yes or no. Do you take phone calls? I took a phone call in about 1986. But... <laughs> OK, sorry, go on. No, but I think that's it. But I think that, but you still have a thing. I, if people don't get back, there's a there's a there's a difficulty in that, Deborah. Of course, of course there is. But I think that um, uh, other other levels, and it's it's a very open conversation here, though. That but it, it is we are the, we're in the buyer's market. That's the thing. So uh, there's a lot of times though where I I've had one experience this uh, this month or oh, November where um, we were offering a job to someone who's come for a job. We've offered it, and I hadn't heard for two weeks anything, not even an acknowledgement of the, an acknowledgement of the offer. Really? Nothing. And when I uh, got my assistant to spend, oh, we, oh, is this a no? Are we moving on? They said, no, we haven't got to that yet. Really, really, that makes me not look forward to this job. Yeah. And any other comments that people... I think we have to forget about the domestic Any, anybody else get uptight about, about something? This is your moment. This is it. I feel immensely guilty about the number of emails I have from Deborah that I haven't replied to. But actually, more generally, the number of emails I have from all of you that I don't reply to. Hmm. Part of that is sometimes a specific email gets lost, and I presume it's a general one. And part of that is sometimes it's a good idea and I write it on the list, but my next casting meeting isn't for another six weeks. And so actually, I don't have any response to give you yet. It's going to be discussed and it's going, it's going to be discussed seriously. But by the time I actually get back to my desk after that casting meeting, six weeks later, I've actually sort of forgotten who the suggestion came from in the first place. I just know it was a good suggestion on my list. So if we've decided to offer it, then you'll get an email back. But it might be three months later. OK, Qu quickly, if this, if this is a Patrick, Patrick, yes. I have to say that I haven't heard anything from these people that I don't have every day. I mean, I probably get 150 yeah. emails every yeah. week from artists who wish to be represented. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would be very surprised if three of them every month have actually targeted it in a sensible way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, the world, it's the world we live in, absolutely so. Yes. Um, time is, is running short. We're, we're forgetting the whole other side of this. The offer is made, James. From this point, an, a different ball game starts. Uh, the whole business of servicing a, a contract. Perhaps you, we should start, though, actually, with, with fee negotiation. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want to make you an offer, the fee negotiation. Mm -hmm. These guys good at doing that? Uh, well, once again, there's a few agents in here that know me very well. I just when I, uh, There was a point when I was the only person in my office for, for many years. It was only me. And the, the shorthand I got then was that um, I try not to waste t people's time. And so I made the offer, which is the offer. So I tend not to negotiate, but not in a, in a, in a silly way, it's just that's, that's how much we've got. I hate that, I want to get you for that, so I'll offer that, so you back me down to that. So it's, it's pretty direct. So um, I don't really change that much. Um, and a lot of people that know us know that now, so it's a straightforward thing. Because I don't mind in the slightest, as I've said to many people in this room over the years, I don't mind people in the slightest saying no to job because they think it's not right for them, well, the money's not enough. but. You know, I don't like anything of, well, you know, we get more than this from ENO. Because I always say, well, if, if I got a 12 and a half million pound grant, I'd pay you more. Which raises, Bruno, the question of this is another area that an artist manager needs to research by the opera house. I mean, you, well, need, you, you need to understand the opera house in terms of their fee structure. Absolutely. And I, um, the situation I had at the Chatelet, for instance, was absolutely not comparable to what an English summer festival will have. Because, of course, the, the means, as you've rightly um, highlighted, are so different. And I think just as managers should target previous communication, according to the House, they should indeed, most of them do anyway, target fee negotiation according to the House. Um, if I may say something, as far as fee negotiation is concerned, I know that it's 
these people's business to get as much as better as good a deal as they possibly can for their artist and it's my business also to get as good a deal as i can for my house so i accept negotiation and i accept there will be to and fro and i accept that there will be some given some negotiation especially because in a big house you are in a position to negotiate because your fee allow your budget allows you to do so there's a difference uh, i have two categories of managers in that respect there are some who know knowing full well what their artist's average fee level is, will probably start 25 25% higher. And I totally accept that. You start 25% higher, I raise 5%, you go, you know, I, you know, and then you get to an average which is maybe 10% above your average artist fee level because your one of your aims and one of your duties as a manager is to progressively raise your average artist fee level. Otherwise, if they stay on the same fee level for 20 years, you're not doing your job. So I do understand there's something like that. And if a manager starts on that level and we have an exchange of, let's say, four or five emails, I mean, I'm sorry, but we, we, you know, that's how I did it at the Chatelet. We all have different lives. If I have an exchange of four or five emails by which the artist, the manager will have compromised a bit and I will have compromised a bit, I find that part of the business is normal. Mm -hmm. Some managers will double something. I, if an artist gets 4,000 everywhere, there are, some people offer me 5,000, which I fully understand. Some people will start at eight or at 10, and then I get rude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you know, then the negotiation can end up being 20. Or I've, I've, I can think of one person, whom I will not mention here, whom we all oh, love. Oh, go on. No, no. <laughs> What's it worth? Uh, I, we can negotiate <laughs> the fee. <laughs> Who, you know, I remember engaging one tenor for a Strauss opera, and the actual negotiation was 20 emails one way and 20 emails that way. I was close to telling my intendant, I'm sorry, can we just get another But you, you did stick with it. I mean, you, I you stuck with it because my intendant wanted me to have yeah, that tenor, so right, I was right, going right, to go with it. Yeah. I don't, but I got very rude. Yeah, but how often have you not, uh, had a, a, an engagement uh, just never eventuated because of the fee? How often does it break down at this point, Laura? Almost never, honestly. I mean, I think you should. Yeah, you should know what my fee structure is before you uh, before you even start a conversation with me about the artist. And if you don't, you should ask. I have huge respect for for an agent who hasn't worked with me before. When I ask if somebody is free for a particular role, if the response comes back, yes, she might be free, but I don't know very much about you. Can we can we have a frank conversation about your fee structure? That's totally reasonable, and I would much rather do it at that time and not waste everybody's um, precious time. Okay, well, Laura, let me stay with you. The business, of the rest of the servicing of a contract, there's a long time until the, the curtain goes up on the first performance. How important is, is that to you, that this is, is, is watertight and done exactly right in each case? It, it, I can't tell you how massively important the detail of every day is and it can be hard I don't I didn't understand that before I worked in an opera house and I still get surprised what, quite. Sort, of, what sort of stuff the different the difference between a flight being at two and a flight being at four can be the difference as to whether we can rehearse successfully or not so if you put in an NA request which forgets to mention the fact that the last flight is actually at six then it, it, it is immensely frustrating and, this happens. and embarrassing this happens a lot, it ha a lot? Mo I, most of the time most, most of the time. Most of the time, I get an e if I get an NA request, I have to respond to it to say, okay, tell me more. When would they actually have to leave rehearsal? And when will they actually be back? And what are they actually singing? James, this makes sense to you? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that, that makes sense. I think that the thing is, as always says, the detail about the, the day of the concert is the least of the, of the problems with an NA, really. It's, it is the travel. And the regularity of the travel, if it's a couple of them. You know, it could be the... I get asked, uh, you know, sometimes for the the seventeenth and the twentieth, but then when we get into it, it's well, it's difficult to come back on the eighteenth, nineteenth, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so that then that starts a different thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, most of the time that's okay. We can get to it, but it just makes it everything's a bit more stressful for everyone. And I think that it's the thing I'd rather have uh, the clarity in the argument, even if it's an argument six months earlier than have it just when it's starting to get a bit too close well, to change. Bruno, is, is this area 
a function of selling. I mean, if, if you were really badly let down, say by a junior, let's say in a junior in office, over something like Laura's describing, w might that affect the way that you responded to an artist manager when they were trying to sell you an artist next time around? To a certain extent, although I try to be objective, um, indeed, I would complain about it, uh, but I'll try not to have um, preconceptions because it's not because they've made one mistake one day with one artist that it will always make it. Or what would rather happen is if I've known somebody's been really slack with something, I would still deal with that manager, but I would make sure that, I mean, I would not let go of them. I would make sure that they covered every detail. Yeah. I think that's the thing, is I would turn down the next NA request. And at the end of the day, an NA is not a right, it's a privilege. <laughs> and you, we are paying your artist to rehearse, and you are asking for your artist not to rehearse. Mm. It is for, on you to do the running, to make that as easy as possible for me to get the conductor and director to agree. It is not for me to work out the detail of what, tri what time the train arrives in Zurich. Okay, we have five minutes before drinks. I think uh, Helen, I think, I noticed Helen first. Uh, what would you like to ask? Any sort of question. No, it's really just to echo what Laura says. And what I find sometimes when an artist says, I need an NA for blah, 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 and it might be a family thing or something that we're not directly involved in, experience has taught me to say to them, right, when exactly do you need to travel? And when exactly can you be back? And to do that very research, because often the artist just hasn't thought about it. So we have a responsibility to kind of manage the artist as well in order to spare you the angst. We will take it on, on our shoulders. But um, I'm only saying that generally because you know, it's, it's something I've learned through bitter experience that one's got to do. Yeah. We, we've got to really... I always say to them, we've got two lots of clients. We have you, the artist, and we have our opera companies whom we also serve. And so very often our relationships with you lovely people last way longer than the artist. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. It's important, I find it very important to make that point to an artist because they're only really interested naturally in themselves. And I have to say that sometimes I do negotiate the following week on behalf of somebody else. I'm not prepared to push that far because my experience is that well, they'll say no and it will irritate me. So, you know, I do feel that we are... We have a divided quality. We earn our money on one side, but by keeping the other side happy. Mm -hmm. The Yeah. Thank you very much. That Robert. Yes, you were a question. A question. Two observations. Pre it's about pre-contractual NAs and post-contractual NAs, mm -hmm. and I think that's worth saying all the time, mm -hmm. especially the younger colleagues. Oh, well, yes. so the other thing I would like to say. Well, do you want to comment first on that? I mean, Bruno, you said, yeah, yeah, that, that rang a bell with That's you. That's very important because, uh, of course, the, the, you're in a different position towards the manager if it's pre-contractual or post-contractual. But I think there's something even worse than that, uh, and it's something to do with ethics. Some managers will have any requests by the time you contract, and they don't tell you, and they wait six months to tell you. So it's neither a pre nor a post. It's something that they knew they would have to face. Oh, their American manager didn't tell you. That's always the line. You know, <laughs> and they didn't tell you because they thought you might say no. Uh, or, you know, in, that's another aspect altogether, which is honesty. Uh, and when we were talking beforehand, I mean, uh, b both Laura and James talked about directness on the part, of, straightness on the part of the artist manager is what one of the things you most value. I think that's right. And what Robert said there is correct about the pre, the pre ones are easy. It's, it's getting easier for me because I've adopted this, um, you know, far ahead schedule, you know, scheduling two months in advance for the first two weeks. So that pre NA, a pre contract NAs are, are fine as long as I know. The post ones are much more difficult. Yeah. Robert, there's another point you wanted to make though. Yes. Which is what do our artist managers want from opera companies? <laughs> and there's just one thing I feel very strongly about, and I would like to still. It's the feedback from auditions. These kids, mm -hmm. most of them are kids, young people, they spend a huge amount of time traveling, dressing up, maybe sometimes taking a few hard pins. We just want five minutes of your time either by, by a quick note or a quick conversation just to say, it's really this, difficult. This, this is an area where we really couldn't really spend difficult. time on. Yes, I have to say it's really it's really James, difficult yes. because we see right. something like um, uh, what well, even the chorus people we've seen maybe three hundred or something this year each. You know to do that, but I think also when it gets to more, it would be lovely in an ideal world that would be great. But 
I do think that it's sometimes the feedback is, you, you know, I wanted someone more than them. And that's not very helpful. It's not very helpful. It's not, but well, I sort of, I've made that point by giving the job to someone else. That, the point is, I've given the job to Are someone else. Are you happy else. with that, Robert? Yeah. No? No. Can I, can I talk about, why, about my experience with feedback? Because actually there's some takeaways here. Um, I've had times where I've sent feedback to an agent and it's been forwarded on immediately. This is and from unedited, an audition. Edited, from, an, from an audition to the artist involved. And me. I, and, and so now I will not give feedback in writing because that, that was not... That, if, if it's not written for the artist to read, I think that's shocking behaviour, frankly. Um, and I've had situations where I give feedback by phone and I'm told I'm wrong. And that happens quite a lot too. Bruno, yes? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I do, um, how I don't really agree about uh, the, art, the things being passed on to the artist. Basically, when I give feedback, which I think is an obligation, even if we don't have time, uh, whereas I feel really guilty about not answering um, an offer from a manager, I don't allow myself not to give feedback on auditions because I do, the person came to us, maybe paid for flights and hotels, so we need to answer. And I give some, I'm known for giving, back, for giving feedback three months after at times, but I always do. Um, I write my feedbacks as professionally, as neutrally as possible so that I assume that they may be passed on to the artist. So I write it in clear things and not offending. I, I'll never say it's terrible or anything like that. It's intonation problems or top not very good or bottom range not voiced. So I will make it as, as professional and, and um, literal as possible so that in case it's passed to the artist, I'm not seen as a bastard from hell. Yes. That's one thing. The, the, the other thing, however, which I think is really very important, is a, a question that, uh, as you've said, and I think it's just about time, it's all about respect, um, is that sometimes you get, a, you get a feedback from your feedback saying they're not happy with what you've said. And, <laughs> and oh, I've, yeah. you know, <laughs> yes. And I've had, you know, I've had situations where I give feedback in an audition and the manager says, OK, Bruno, I don't necessarily agree with you, but this is your opinion and I respect you because you're in, you know. Uh, and I get, lately, I got somebody who said, I violently disagree with what you said. Yes. And they challenged me. And I said, OK, I will not answer, feed, I will not answer request and feedback from you anymore. Okay. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm in a position for a reason and you're in your position for a reason. You ask for feedback, I'll give the feedback. Stay with that. Yeah. Well, the whole business of auditions is something that we'd had time we could have we could have talked about in more detail. Right from you, know, how do you actually acquire the audition? I'll ask I'll, 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 one more question before we actually have a drink. Anybody else got a question on a different subject? So they, this is your chance, as I said. We're fine. Well, look. Thank you. Oh, Bruno, no, a I, final I, word. I, I thought just gave the signal. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't know whose throat's going to actually be cut, but there we go. But look, warmest thanks to our three panellists, Laura well, and James and Bruno. Very, very good.